appreciate everybody who helped last week uh, with, uh, with the kids and uh, uh, we had to go buy all them new batteries for the buses. Uh, had a little visitor uh, last weekend and needed some batteries real bad. Uh, but uh, they won't get them this time. I say got a welding tool. Uh, they locked in. But anyway, that's a shame, isn't it? But I appreciate y'all helping on that. Matthew chapter number seven. Get your Bibles open now. Open to the book of Matthew chapter number seven. Let's all get in the, uh, the word of God here for a few minutes this morning. And I want to bring you a message. Uh, it's heavy on my heart. I know it's for everybody here. Uh, been been studying this the last few days. And the Lord has put this on my heart. Matthew chapter seven. Two kinds of houses beginning with verse number 24, and we'll let that uh, be a home also. It's talking about your home. It ain't talking about just a building. You can have a house and not have a home. And you can have a home and not even have a house. You sure can. There's a lot of people got big houses and no home. And these people got home and don't even have a house. But when, he's, when he talks here, he's, he's talking about both. Look at verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Every man in here needs to make up your mind to do that. And he's not talking about two befores and two by sixes and shingles. It's your home. It's your home. But he's using that as an illustration. And the rain descended. You can count on that. The floods came. You can count on that. And the winds blew. The wind's gonna blow against your marriage, against your home, against your kids. It's gonna happen. And you know what happened? It fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone that doeth these, heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended. And the flood came, it comes to everybody. And the winds blew, it happens to all of us. And beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. I'd like to preach this morning on the subject, the sweetest home on earth. The sweetest home on earth. A house is not necessarily a home. Um, uh, around the family table, 
going to bed at night and all the victories and blessings that you can have in a real Christian home. Winston Churchill said this, of all the virtues of human society are created, strengthened, and maintained by homes that are strong and right. We look at our, we have a big mistake in this country of letting Hollywood define to us what, what life is like. That's the biggest mistake you can make is looking to Hollywood for your example. They're no example for life. They're no example for living, raising kids, marriage, anything. Hollywood is not a good example at nothing except wickedness. Uh, we all know famous families like, like those Kardashians and, and people like that. I feel sorry for them. They uh, know not the Lord. They don't understand uh, uh, a lot of the things of God and, and they need our prayers. It's, it's pitiful. I just read the other day and you hear this all the time. Johnny Depp, the famous actor Johnny Depp of those them old, old crazy weird old movies about pirates and junk like that. Uh, he, he, him and his supposed wife, Amber, whatever her name is, they've had the police call to their house throwing wine bottles at each other and busting them. He's accused her of punching and kicking him. She's accused him of, I mean, I think if a woman hit me, I, I wouldn't be ashamed. To, I'd be ashamed to tell anybody. Uh, but anyway, uh, you, that's the way they are there in Hollywood. They want it equal, they got it equal. And uh, they, they uh, it's pitiful. Those people ain't happy. Those people don't have it. They have money, they have mansions, but they don't have a home. I wanna talk about the sweetest home on earth. Number one, a real Christian home has Christian parents, people that are saved, mama and daddy that are born again. It ought to be the most number one priority of every man and wife in here to know. First of all, know that your personal relationship with God is right, that you've been saved, that you've been born again. He said, uh, Daddy, uh, one time his, his boy uh, turned 15 years old and he was uh, asking him questions. He set his boy down, he's 15 year old, and he said, Son, um, I wanna ask you a question. Being a little bit candid, he said, uh, I wanna ask you a question. What's, what have I done that's helped you the most? What is the best thing that your daddy has done for you? And that boy looked at him and he said, he thought for a minute and he paused and he said, the best thing you've done for me, daddy, is love mama. And he said, really? Really? He said, that's right. He said, why do you say that? He said, because I know you love mama and I know mama loves you. And because of that, I know you're not gonna do mama wrong and y'all are gonna be together and I'm never gonna have to choose which one I wanna live with. And you know what? He, he thought, my goodness, that's, that's hot wisdom for a 15-year-old boy. And it come to find out that one of his friends at school had that day told him that he was gonna have to make a choice of whether he's gonna go with his mom or his dad. I'm certainly not trying to make nobody feel bad that's been through divorce. I mean, I, you, I understand stuff happens, you make the best out of it. But listen, people, the best thing you can do for your kids is love each other and love them and build a real Christian home with real parents. Amen? I, I've, I've, I've been to homes and I've, you learn a lot doing this all these years. And if, if, you're, if you pay attention, life is an education. And especially if you get to travel. The Lord's blessed me. I've been able to travel a lot since I was uh, just started preaching, 19 years old. And, and preaching, I've traveled to foreign countries and all over the United States over and over and over. And a lot of times when I'm off preaching somewhere in Michigan or Texas, where I'm riding down the road and people's talking and I'm not even listening to them, I'm thinking. And I look at them big cities and I see people, maybe see a guy out here on the street and I look, and you know, we go down the rich 
a section where you have to have a, a, a number to get in uh, to even visit. And I, I see all that stuff. And I've been, I've been to nice houses. I've eaten nice houses and nice restaurants. They took us to a restaurant down in, in Pensacola, Florida one time uh, where, I, where it was, uh, you know, it was set way up on top of the You could look out of the Pensacola Bay and they had real white tablecloths and it was like $50 a person, which, it, you know, it's, to me, is you're, you're mentally handicapped if you do something like that. Uh, but uh, uh, they, they, uh, I, I sit there, here comes this guy on a violin coming around and playing me. And I, thought, I looked at him like, what are you doing, man? Do, do, I, don't, I don't want somebody playing on violin looking at me, watching me eat. Then I know ketchup on the table. If you go to a restaurant that can't even put ketchup on the table, you've done got above your raisin, friend. Uh, that's right. They, I asked for ketchup. They brought me a little bitty thing about that big. <laughs> it wasn't enough for two French fries. Uh, they, but anyway, I've been there. And you know what? I've been up in Spruce Pine, uh, preaching up there, and been up in little old houses uh, where they had blocks holding the houses up. Didn't have no underpin on them. And walk in there, boy, no air conditioning. Had the windows up. You know, they don't have a lot of winter. I mean, summer up there, up in the mountain, up in uh, L.A. Y'all been to L.A.? Lower Alapax? Up there in Burnsville and Spruce Pine, Bakersville, up up in there. And, uh, you know, and I've sat down and I've watched how, I just watch people. I've watched people. You can get education doing that. And I watched them and I thought, you know what? Uh, Some of them old people, mom come in there with an old print dress and set them hot biscuits down on the table. And your kids out in the yard uh, playing and they come in and pray. And you can just feel the presence of the Lord in that home. And I thought, you know what? Don't feel sorry for them old backwood hillbillies. Hey, some of them got more happiness and joy uh, than some of the people in Hollywood will ever have. That's who y'all feel sorry for. People don't know. So a, a Christian home has real Christian parents. Christian parents. If you are a parent here this morning, you make sure that you are saved and right with God. The sweetest home on earth is where there are Christian parents. Number two. Listen to this carefully. A Christian home has a strong church connection. A Christian home, can't overemphasize, has a strong church connection. A real sweet Christian home will get a local church not a TV church, unless you're out in the desert and have to. Uh, not, a, not a ministry you hear on the radio. A local church and get your family and become a part of that local church. That's God's plan. God put local churches all over that, uh, uh, the, 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 all over Asia and, and uh, Jerusalem and Israel in the early church to show his plan is for local churches to be all over the place and people bring their families and put them in a local church. It is God's plan and God's blessed and best for your home to make your family a part of a Bible-believing Bible preaching church where the Bible is preached, where the kids are taught, where you have stability and you have a church family. That's a big part of having the sweetest home on earth. Sunday school teachers, when they get your kids, your, your, your kids need Sunday school. Sometimes you think Sunday school like, no big deal, I'll just mosey on over at 11. Uh, everybody here needs Sunday school and especially you with kids. The, the Sunday school teacher reads reiterates what the preacher said. The Sunday school teacher reiterates what mom and daddy said. And they're hearing it, they're hearing it. They're saying, my mom and daddy said that same thing. My preacher said the same thing. My Sunday school class, it's a tremendous part of having a real Christian home is being a part of a Bible-believing church. Youth groups, youth activities. Uh, uh, we're getting ready to do a lot of stuff with youth here. Youth service next Sunday night. Youth meetings before then. I got it wrong then go. Prayer meetings Friday the, the 5th, the 12th is going to sing. And uh, I, things just shoot through here while I'm up here. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, we're getting ready to have youth groups. We're getting ready to have youth meetings. We're getting ready to have, hit the streets and give out flyers for the youth rally and, and the youth rally itself, my, 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 what an opportunity to get your kids into something that could be life changing for them. Listen, we're living in a time when the devil is after your kids. You parents listen to me, the devil's out there 24 hours a day after your boys and after your girls and my kids and my grandkids. The devil is 
after them. You know what I told them? I said, get them in every church service you can get them in. They can be a part of everything the youth do, youth camp, youth choir, youth singing. Let them be a part of every bit of that. It is a part of structure that our kids need. The sweetest home on earth has a strong church connection and you become a part of a good church and don't miss it for every little old thing that comes along be faithful to your church and honor the Lord and God will bless you for it. let me tell you something can I, can I just talk uh, personal face to face with you for a minute without you thinking I'm bragging I'm bragging on the Lord but God's give us a good church we're not perfect we're a long way from it we got our problems and we got a problem but I'm going to tell you something knowing the right book ain't one of them and doctrine ain't one of them. You get sound doctrine here at this church. You ought to thank God for a sound doctrine, Bible believing, hellfire, damnation, a straight, balanced, Bible preaching church. Listen, there's people online who watch us all the time that move here from other states to come to this church. I know we got our problems. I, we can all find fault. I've got mine, you've got yours. But I'll tell you one thing, brother. If I was in your shoes, I'd take advantage of having my kids in a Bible-preaching, Bible-believing church. Listen, that youth rally over there is like none other. I, there's very few places your kids can go where they will see and feel and hear what they're gonna hear over there at that youth rally. The sweetest home on earth has a strong church connection. Amen? I have people write us all the time and say, please pray for us. We live in New Mexico. We live in Colorado. We live in Africa almost weekly. I said, we'd give anything. One guy over there, he says, I'd give anything in the world to come to Shining Light Baptist Church. They don't have it. We do. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. One little boy said one time, he come to Sunday school and the teacher said, little Johnny, I sure am glad to see you. I'm glad you made it this morning. He said, yeah, my daddy made me come. And she said, well, that's good, son. I'm proud of him. Thank the Lord for your daddy. He made you come to Sunday school. That's good. And he said, yeah, he said, they was all going fishing and I want to go real bad. He said, there wasn't enough seats in the boat and made me come to church. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good daddy right there. That's a great example for your kids. Like a little boy one time said, uh, uh, come in and his daddy's sitting there reading the Sunday morning paper. He said, get ready son, go to Sunday school. And he's sitting there reading the paper and he said, what are you doing? I'm tired, I worked all week. And he said, daddy, did you go to Sunday school when you was little? He said, yes I did. And the little boy walked out and said, probably won't do me no good neither. <laughs> we got too many parents that say, now you do what I say, don't do like I do. Hey, you be the example for them, amen? That's right, amen, hallelujah. I'd be a part, listen, I'd join this church today if I was you. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mis, misrepresenting it at all. Thank God we've got a Bible-believing church to be a part of. That's a big part of having a godly home. Number three, a Christian home has certain vital elements in it. Certain things that are absolutely vital for a, a, the sweetest home on earth. Uh, there's like unity. We should get along. Nobody wants to live where it's constantly fussing and fighting and throwing things and cussing each other out. We have, I have had bunches of, of kids go home with us and, and, uh, and, and took them on trips and revivals. And we've had teenagers, especially in the summer, they'll stay at our house two or three days. Had two of them last night. We're in here somewhere. Uh, there's one, uh, and there's one back yonder, Storm. And uh, they stayed at our house yesterday and come to church. But, and, and I have had bunches of them when we're driving down the road, and they'll say, do I have to go home today? And I said, well, I reckon you do. You have to. And they, you know, I've always, that's always bothered me. There's something wrong with a kid that don't want to go home. My girls growing up, I remember, I remember, I always told them, I said, look, y'all should want to be here more than you want to be other. And they had their friends, and I guess I guess because I let them run wild downstairs, but they always had a bunch of friends spending the night with them, and I'd, I'd, I'd go down and talk, tell them a Bible story. Or I remember laying, I remember Carrie would have all her friends over, a bunch of little girls about that high, and the living room floor would be full of them. 
And then, then she said, Daddy, you gonna tell us a story? And I said, I, I'll be there in a minute. I'm busy. And finally, I'd get up one, and I'd go down there, and them little girls would be pulling up that cover over their, almost over their eyes like that. And my eyes were running all over the living room, man. I was David and Goliath, and I'd cut Goliath's head off, buddy, and it was bloody. It was better than any scary movie on TV. I mean, I had his guts hanging out. I had David holding up like that, and blood running out of his head. And them little girls, they was watching me like that. And I thought, you know what? And they said, we'd like to go to your house. And I'm glad they did. Listen, there's something wrong with a kid that don't want to go home. So all mom and daddy does is scream and holler and fuss and, and throw things and cuss each other. God help parents this morning to realize you have a child. I read the other day, a woman, 27 years old, killed her nine-year-old and four-year-old, and then shot and killed herself. This week, there's a story. A woman was in jail, and she got arrested on possession of heroin. And you know, inmates talk. And she's in there and told another inmate, a woman inmate, what had really happened, because her son had been missing for several months. And the police checked, couldn't find him. She had a seven-year-old boy that went missing. So she confessed it to the other woman in prison. She said, my son was getting on our nerves. Come to find out, her and her husband would not let that little boy eat. And they put him in a pet cage, like a dog, a dog cage, about that, where he had to just do like that and couldn't, and couldn't stand up, couldn't sit down. And they put him in there so they could party seven years old. And they said one night during the summer, he was crying and they didn't pay no attention to him. And they hadn't paid no attention to him because he'd done that all the time. He kept saying, Mama, I'm thirsty. Mama, I'm hot. And they was drunk, passed out or something, went in there the next day and he's dead in that cage. Seven years old. And they took that boy so they wouldn't get caught and poured mixed up concrete and poured it down in that cage and around him and put it in a storage bin. And she confessed that to that woman in, in jail and the police went to that place and sure enough, found that dog cage with concrete, busted it. That little boy's body is on the inside. I'm telling you, that's just a tiny bit of what we hear. You have no idea some of the things that our bus kid's sitting right here this morning there's kids back yonder in that junior church. There's kids sitting in here today that live in the most unbelievable conditions you can imagine of sin and all. Lady, I, I heard a guy this week who was mad, grown man, who, 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 was, uh, who got mad because somebody said something about him on, on Nosebook. He put a bunch of stuff on there. The other person put a bunch of stuff on there. And he hired a guy to go over and kill that man did y'all hear about that? It was on the news because he put he be, he defriended him. He defriended him, so he sent somebody over to kill him. Now, people, I'm telling you this morning. You look at me this morning. You hear me? We are living in a sick, weird, twisted, messed up society when when forty and fifty year old men are trying to have somebody killed because of something they put on nosebook. If anybody ever tells you, Brother Danny posted this. If anybody ever tells you, Brother Danny tweeted it, you tell them, I don't know what you've been smoking, but you got some bad dope and wrong information because it ain't true. Amen. The only tweeting I'm going to do is when I get up and I hear them birds out in my yard and go, tweet, tweet, I can do it just like they can. I try to mock them sometimes. Say amen right there. I'm a grown man. What's a grown man doing on playing with toys? A grown man playing on the internet all day long. God have mercy on. It's bad enough for kids to be kids, let alone grown people. Amen. I'll tell you when it's time to pray. Don't bow your head yet, please. I didn't say it's a sin. I know you just use yours for the Lord. And I know all you watch on TV is the news and the ball game. I know that. I've heard that bull for years. Uh, uh, I'm telling you, there's something wrong with a society that, that wages war 
typing with their thumbs. And they need to go, good Lord, people, grow up. I mean, good. Hey, get rid of throw that thing to trash. Or if you can't use it for God, get rid of it. Use it for the Lord, praise God. If you don't, get rid of it, just like anything else. Ain't that right? A Christian home, brother. I, uh, you say, Brother Danny, it's not. I heard a story this week also. A man was doing a, a study. He had a bunch of parents together of kids. He said, now you gotta watch who you let your kids meet and talk to online. We're living in a different day. Uh, it happened that all that. And this woman said, oh, I, my daughter's 14. I don't have to worry about her. I got a good, she got a good head on her shoulders. I want, and he said, well, uh, we'll see about that. He didn't tell her. They did a setup on that girl. And they set her up. Somebody started texting her. See, you can send this, you can go in some little boy magazine and cut out some pictures of a cute little boy and send it. This is me. And she, that girl, they took the mother about two or three weeks later into this house. They hid her, you know, hid the cars like they do in them when they them sting operations like that. And they said, now, I just want you to sit here for a few minutes. This man, who was an undercover agent, had been texting your daughter, wanting to meet, meet up and hook up together. And my mother watched as her little 14-year-old daughter come up them steps, rung that doorbell, and came in that house. She said, honey, what you do that? Don't you know you could have been killed? Let me tell you what's wrong with the little girls. They watch so much junk on TV, they're filled with lust. And the boys are 10 times worse. They're full of lust. And they think when somebody, they, they follow that burning desire of the flesh and brother, they're getting murdered and raped. They found one girl 80 miles away with her throat cut. Sometimes like she'd been talking to online. A real home has vital elements, and one of them is some kind of structure. And honor. your kids should not have open, free access to the internet. No kid should. Yours, mine, none of them. You can't trust none of them or yourself. Number three. Number four, I'm sorry. Number four. A Christian home has a family altar. A Christian home has a family altar. Now what's a family altar? You read the word of God. You pray. You pray before meals. Sometimes you t your kids will tell on you, you know. Uh, we'll have kids on us and we're getting ready to eat and they just sit down and just start eating. I said, don't y'all pray before you eat? We said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You should pray before you eat. Bow your head. Teach them. That's mom and daddy's job. Teach your family. Well, I, if you are embarrassed to pray in front of your own family, you, you are not much of a warrior, friend. Uh, you're not really much of a soldier for Jesus. If you can't say, all right, let's all bow our heads and ask God to bless the food. Lord, have mercy, man. Uh, mama has to do it half time because daddy's too backslid to do it. And mama has to say, all right, let's all pray. And he's reaching over grabbing a biscuit or something while she's praying. And the kids are rolling their eyes because they, they want to hurry and get watch the ball game. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it don't, uh, a family altar, a family, a real family prays. Pray for them before they go to school. Before they go to school, grab their hand. I used, I used pray my girl and I used to say, Lord, right in front of them, I'd say, Lord, bless them, Lord. Take care of them. Don't let nobody mess with them. Protect them, Lord. And if they do something wrong, get them. And they'd say, Dad hit him. Yeah, I mean it. I still mean it. The Lord, I want the Lord to correct them where they're wrong. You should pray with a kid before you discipline it. Don't fly off and knock your head off. You know, I ain't no way to do it. Come down and say, now look, you know why we have to do this. You know, no, no, let's have a word of prayer. And it, you, did you do that, brother? I sure did. I sure did. Gives you time to calm down, act like you got some sense. And it helps them to understand that. Or you, and, and then after it's over, uh, pray again, hug them, tell them you love them. It's done. And it's over. And you're going to move on. That's right. A real home has a family altar. If they're having fam a problem at school, if they're getting bullied before they go to school, grab their hand and say, look. Lord, I pray for uh, that person at school that's giving this kid a hard time. I pray that you'd help them and help 
our kid to be nice to them and get along with them and be a Christian example and a Christian testimony. If they got a problem with their teacher, pray with them. Pray. They ought to know that the, listen, train your kids that the answer to everything is praying and turning to Jesus Christ. I believe that. I believe that. I believe every problem in the world, the answer is put it in the Savior's hands. Put it in the Savior's hands, amen? Kids should hear their mom and dad praying. They should hear you pray for the youth rally. They should hear you uh, pray. We pray out there in the car. Uh, a lot of times uh, we'll pull in and we had a car. I had them in the car with me this morning and before they get out, I say, let's pray. All right, dear Lord, I pray you'd run the demons off, bless the services today. Before you get out of the church, out of the car to come into church, that's a good idea. Just get us establish a pattern. Let them hear you pray. Let them know you believe in praying. When they grow up, they'll say, I know what my daddy did when problems come up. He prayed. Teach them that. A real Christian home has a family altar. Let them hear you pray for the youth rally. Every night before they go to bed, Lord bless the youth rally. Lord bless that youth rally. Teach them how they're going to know if mom and daddy don't train them at home. And number five, and I'm done. A real Christian home is a foretaste of our heavenly home. The closest thing you can get to heaven on earth is a Christian home where mom and dad love each other and the kids are happy and the presence of God is in the home. Many kids are growing up never seeing anybody nice or even cordial to each other. A lot of times a boy will wind up treating his wife like his daddy treated his mother. It's, it's uh, as, as psychologists and, and, and counselors. A, a, a girl will wind up treating her husband just like uh, her, her mama treated her daddy. That's why before you marry her, you better look and see how she treats her daddy. Before you marry him, you better see how he, how he uh, uh, treats his, his, his mother. Amen? And you know, uh, you know that's what they say about a girl. They say a girl won't only look like her mom, she'll act like her. Scary thought, ain't it? Amen. And he'll look just like the old papa pretty soon. So you better have more than that. Like that one fellow, he said, look, he said, ever, ever since gravity finally won, everything just goes down. That one preacher said he had uh, furniture disease. His chest didn't drop in his drawers. <laughs> That's awful, uh, but, uh, but I but I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I, cut that out, please. Uh, but I want to tell you something, brother. Uh, they they change, people change, people change. A real Christian home is a foretaste of the heavenly home. Mom and dad are types of God. If parents get their kids ready for heaven, you've done the best thing you can do for them. I'll tell you a story. Years ago, I was preaching up in Virginia. Just across the Virginia line, it's been a long time ago. Way up yonder where we used to go to Shatley Springs, you remember that? Yeah. Near there, just across the Virginia line, about, I don't know, two and a half, two and a half hours from here, something like that. And I just started preaching. The preacher took me up there. And back then, in, back then in, the, in those days, when you'd have a revival, people in the church would cook. He didn't go out, he was out in the country and ever, people would have the preacher over ever after or lunch or something uh, for, to, for a meal. And so you just went with the pastor and different a lady cooked all week long. That's the way everybody used to do it. Don't do that much anymore. Uh, they'll walk up and give the pastor $20 and say, here, take him to McDonald's and I won't fool with it. But that, back then, people cooked. And the preacher, he drove me. We went way out in the country and way out in the country. And I like North Carolina, but right up there in the first part of Virginia is some really, really beautiful country. It really is. I mean, it's open space. It's got hills, but you can just see forever. And we went and drove and drove and drove and drove and drove and got out in the country, pulled in this big old dirt driveway, and there was a big old farm house. You could tell it was old, old. And like I said a while ago, just blocks or, or something, underneath it. it didn't have underpinning so the dogs could go up under the porch that's where the dogs slept and they had dirt in the yard some of them people used to their front yard was dirt have you ever seen your grandma take the broom and sweep the front yard anybody ever seen that you kids have no clue now but that's why people boy your yard looks good clean I swept it a while ago 
and it was all right until it rained, but it was like that. The dirt, old red dirt went up under the, the porch like that, and I was about 20, 21 years old, and I remember walking up them steps. The wood didn't have no paint on it, like, and a big old porch would go all the way around. It wasn't a fancy house. It was an old house. Had a porch all the way around the front of it. They said, we want to take you to meet Harvey, Brother Danny. Harvey really wants to meet you. And I said, who's Harvey? And they said, Harvey Mull. said, he can't come to church, but he really wants to meet you. And we walked, I remember walking in there next step, and here, here comes an old lady out like that, and she's got gray hair, and her dress is down to there, and, and she's wiping like this, you know, wiping, and say, how you doing, preacher? I appreciate you coming. It's an honor to have you to come to my house. And there's Daddy. And they said, come here, won't you meet Harvey? And we walked in, walked in the back room, and there was a bed, like a hospital bed. And a man lay there in that bed, Harvey Mull. Harvey at that time, I think, was about 35. Never had walked a step. Born a paraplegic. And spent his life in bed. His, his head was normal size, but his little body just grew like that right there in the bed, and he couldn't do nothing. He, he lay there like that right there, and he laid there all day and listened to preaching. And his hero was Maze Jackson. Brother, back when Maze Jackson had the truck driver's special, they said he listens to Brother Maze every day. He didn't have internet and stuff like just a little AM radio. And I remember coming there, and he looked around, and he said, Hey, Brother Danny, sure is good to meet you. I heard you doing some good preaching. You like Brother Mays? I said, yep, I like to hear Brother Mays. I like the truck driver's special. He said, I listen to him every day. I listen to him every day, and that's all he could do. And that old boy lay down, and Mama put her hand on the bed. That's their life. They don't go to Disney World. They never been to the beach. They, Harvey never been to a big fancy restaurant, or they didn't have a Cadillac. And they lay, lay there, and Harvey couldn't even get up and come to the table. He had to stay in the bed. But he laid there and listened to preaching. And he'd say, the Lord sure has been good to me. And I mean, I was 20 years old, and all this is going in my head, and I'm thinking, oh, boy, you better pay attention right here. God's teaching you something real important. right? I could feel God's presence. We sat down there at that table, and it was like a Holy Ghost revival. Cut night, I thought I was going to shout. And I learned a real lesson that day. I learned that stuff don't make a home and make people happy. They had an old hardwood floor. I'm not, look, if you got a nice house, praise God. There ain't nothing wrong with it. I hope you get a nicer one, everybody here. I'm not, don't, don't take that wrong. But I'm telling you, that house ain't gonna make no home. The Lord was in that place. And I remember leaving there and I thought, I have got an education today, buddy. When it comes right down to it, all that matters is knowing the Lord is in your home and in your house and in your marriage and your kids know who Jesus is. That's all that's gonna matter one of these days, folks. I love that song we heard the other day. Somebody sang it up here. Uh, Donna's uh, family and them, they said, there's a family Bible on the table. Its pages are torn and hard to read. But that family Bible on the table will ever be my key to victory. I can see a sitting round the table as from the family Bible, dad would read. I can hear my mother softly singing, rock of ages, rock of ages, cleft for me. We've got so far away. This social media and stuff has ruined Many Christian homes. Amen. I'm not saying it's wrong to have. I got a phone laying in there on my desk. You know, I don't mess with it during church. I, I got a I got a TV at home, but I'm telling you, people, that don't make a Christian home. Let's get in this altar this morning. She's coming, and let's just say, Lord, I'd like to have one of them sweet homes. He's talking talking about. It ain't got nothing to do with money. It ain't got nothing to do with how big or how many square feet you have in your house. It ain't got nothing to do with how good looking or smart you are. It's having the Lord right there in the middle of it. Let's stand right here. Come on.
Come on, let's pray. Amen. 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 Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Teenagers, mamas and daddies, come on. Get your heart right this morning. Get your heart right this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. That's right. That's right. Come on. You say, well, Brother Danny, my home's in a mess. Well, right here's the answer. You can go to counseling for 10 years. You ain't going to do what the Lord can do here in five minutes. How about it this morning? How about it this morning? Mamas and daddies, husbands and wives, put that home on the altar this morning. Put it on the altar. And say, dear God, dear God, please. Oh, God, please. Everybody, y'all pray. God, I pray for my brother Larry this morning. Lord, that you'd bless him. Lord, I know he's been through a hard time. Lord, it's been rough on him lately, physically and spiritually and emotionally and financially in every way. I pray you bless him. Bless him and his family. Help him to overcome. Help him to get the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray right now in Jesus' name that you'd help him. Lord, please help him. Please help him, Lord. Please help him, Lord Jesus. Do what ought to be done. God, work in his heart. Work in his life. Supply these needs, God, and take care of him, Lord. Rebuke the devil from away from here. God, may the Holy Ghost revival come to shining like Baptist church. God, get us ready for the youth rally. God, get us ready for the days ahead, weeks ahead, and, and years ahead. Oh, God, Lord, help families that are struggling this morning. Help them, Lord, get their heart right with you today. Help those that are out and backslid, backslid this morning, not even in the house of God. I pray you'd get a hold of their hearts. God, help us today, we pray, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm praying this morning. Amen. Y'all keep praying as long as you need to. That's good. Uh, what a blessing to see families up here. What a blessing to see husbands and wives up here praying. That's the answer. That's what the devil hates right there, y'all. That's what he hates. That's what he hates. That's what he hates. Praise God, y'all. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. Hallelujah. Woo! Amen. Amen. The answer to your marriage problem is Jesus right here on the altar. The answer to your physical problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. The answer to your emotional, spiritual, financial problems is give it to the Savior. I love that song. It's in the Savior's hands. It's in the Savior's hands. This old world will make you think the way to be happy is get more, do more, look better, have better. That ain't going to make you happy. Amen. You put it in the Savior's hands. He'll bless you for it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Y'all pray for this man. He's he got a rough week. Brother and nephew died on his birthday. And it is rough. Physical, just got out of the hospital. Pray the Lord just happen. Amen. You think you got it bad. Get out. That's why you ought to come to church. There's always somebody worse off than you are. Amen. All right. All right. We're going to stop right there this morning. Now, uh, uh, we're going to change gears tonight and do some commitment. Now, tonight's a very important service. So change your mind. If you wasn't planning on coming back tonight, make the sacrifice. Make the drive. Come back tonight. Be here. And let's really get in here and get ready. Choir practice at 5 o'clock. If you're in the choir or should be, be here at 5 o'clock this evening. Okay? All right.